worship with the Presbyterians in Laurel and Belden, Nebraska. We are just thrilled that you are worshiping with us, and we pray that you will be blessed by the presence of the risen Lord in this time of worshiping with us together. Today the theme is focusing our eyes on Christ, the story of Peter walking on the water and beginning to sink when he took his eyes off reminds us that our peace and uh, our faith is all about staying focused on Jesus and uh, forgetting about all the rest. There are places in the video where you will see print that is gold. Those are options for you to read in response to what I read. But because we are not together in worship, you are in your space and I'm in mine, you feel free to read whatever you wish. There are unison readings and there are responsive readings and I just invite you to read whatever feels worshipful to you. I invite you to join me in the responsive call to worship. O oh God, some of us are discouraged and long for your embrace. Wash us with your love. Some of us are weary, weighed down by desperation. Wash us with your hope. Some of us are anxious and seek refuge from chaotic lives. Wash us with your peace. Some of us are restless, yearning for renewal or forgiveness. Wash us with your grace. However we come into your presence, pour your spirit upon us. Draw our eyes to you now and calm the waters of our lives as we gather to worship you. Amen. The early part of our service is a time of gathering. We gather when we are able, we gather in a building together. Right now during this pandemic, we're not able to do that safely and so we gather spiritually. We're gathered in God's grace and we gather ourselves spiritually. We come together in our minds and in our hearts we gather ourselves to Christ. We turn our eyes upon Jesus. And so a part of that gathering is to lay aside all that keeps us from worship. All that stuff that distracts us. Things that divide us from one another. Maybe you've been hurt by someone this week or maybe you've hurt someone this week. We do that. 
We are all sinners. We forget that sometimes when we come to church. We, we think we're the ones that are, have got it all pulled together, or we ought to. But we aren't. We're no different than anyone else. And so in our gathering time, we confess that. God knows that about us. And God welcomes us to humble ourselves and confess it and, and let go of it all so that we're not all hung up about it. So I invite you to come to this time in service when we, when we confess our brokenness together to God. And in that confessing together, we also forgive receive God's forgiveness, and share that forgiveness with one another. Let us pray a prayer for hope and forgiveness. Lord of wind and waves, creation and creatures, your power is at work everywhere, stilling the storms, offering peace, lifting us up from the depths of our greatest fears. You come to us immediately when we call, and yet, we lack faith in your ability and will to work within and around us. We get distracted and afraid, focused on that which threatens us rather than the one who saves us. We act out of a sense of scarcity as if there is not enough of God's love, grace, and abundant goodness for everyone. In our anxiousness, we hurt those entrusted to our care. We injure the earth we are to steward and we fail to tend your sheep. Forgive our failings and mistakes, and in your mercy, reform us into the people you call us to be, those blessed to be a blessing. Amen. The reading from the epistle today is from Romans 10. Two of those verses form an assurance of pardon, promising us the forgiveness that God gives to us. Verse 13 says, everyone who calls on the name of God shall be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of God shall be saved. And verse 11 says, no one who believes in Jesus, no one who believes in Jesus will be put to shame. No one who believes in Jesus will be put to shame. No one dare say, shame on you. We all do shameful things. But no one who believes in Jesus will be put to shame, says Romans. Trusting this sure promise, we rejoice that God hears our confession and forgives us. Friends, believe this good news in Christ Jesus. We are new creations. God loves us with an everlasting love. And nothing we can do mars that love. Nothing we can do shames us if we believe in Jesus. That's the promise from Romans 10. Believe it and rejoice in it. May the peace of Christ be yours. I would like to in invite you to sing. The song is in Latin, but it's easy. It's Dona Nobis Pacem. And it simply means, grant us peace. Dona nobis pacem. If you're not comfortable singing it, you may just listen. It repeats again and again. And it can be sung as a round. Dona nobis pacem. Grant us peace. Grant us peace. Oh, no, 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 no,
now we have the joy of a story from Sharon Beckenhauer. Good morning. This is Sharon B. with Channel 4 News with a live breaking report. I'm here on the shore of Lake Galilee where a most unusual event has taken place. Now the people who live and work in this area are telling me that a man named Peter almost drowned in the wind and the waves that we had from the storm last night. And while no one seems to know how Peter got into the water, a most extraordinary tale is being told about his rescue. And it would seem that a person was seen walking on top of the water to pull Peter from it and rescue him. Now I'm gonna stay on this story and I hope to find one of the participants so that I can do a live interview. But until I do, I'll be sending you back to the studio. This is Sharon B from Channel 4 News signing off. Wow, that would be quite a story, wouldn't it? But there weren't TV studios or radio stations back then in Bible times. People heard things, they saw things, and they told their friends what they had seen or heard. And then later, people like the disciples wrote those stories down, or people who lived in Bible times. And that's what we have in our Bible today, are the stories from those people. Today's story was actually reported in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John. You see, Jesus and the disciples had had a very long day, and they were exhausted. Jesus had been teaching a crowd of people, and he'd been healing many sick people. His disciples had just finished handing out food to over 5,000 men, women, and children. You remember that story from last week. Well, anyway, they were tired, and Jesus told the disciples to get in the boat and go to the other side of Lake Galilee. The crowds of people had left, and Jesus went off alone to find a quiet place where he could pray. Later that night, the boat was quite a ways off from the shore and a storm had come up and the wind was whipping the waves around and Jesus started walking towards the boat. He started walking on top of the water and as he got closer the disciples saw him and they said they were so afraid because they thought he was a ghost but Jesus called out to them and he said, do not be afraid, it is I, Jesus. Well, Peter wanted to be sure. And so he said, Lord, if it is really you, call out to me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and he started walking on the water towards Jesus. And everything was fine, but then all of a sudden he looked around and he saw the wind blowing the waves and he got scared and he started to sink. And he yelled out, Lord, save me. And Jesus reached out his hand and caught Peter. And he said, Peter, why do you doubt? Well, they got back in the boat and just like that, the wind stopped. The storm was over. Why do you think that Peter started to sink? That's right. He took his eyes off of Jesus. As long as he kept his eyes on him, he was okay. But when he looked around, he became afraid. And that's when he started to sink. You know, we all go through some rough times in our lives, times when things aren't going the way we want or bad things happen to us. Kind of like now when we can't all be together to have Sunday school in person. 
But if we remember to keep our eyes on Jesus, we'll be okay. It's only when we take our eyes off of him or when we start to think that we can solve all of our problems ourselves that we begin to sink like Peter. Say a little prayer with me. Dear Lord Jesus, when the storms of life come against us, help us to remember to keep our eyes on you and keep our faith and trust in you. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, there are a lot of things in your packets this week, and one of them is the little storybook that we often have. And I want to remind you that there's always a question on page seven after you've read the story. And this week's question says, how could Peter have kept on walking on water? And I want to give you a hint that I think your craft projects will help you answer that question today. The first one is a picture of Jesus and the boat trying to make it so it shows up. And when you color and cut out the page, you, you need to color it, but then cut on the dotted line down here. And then you have a puppet to make of Peter. If you color him and stick him with some tape or glue him to the stick that I put in your packet, you can actually insert him into the picture. See if I can find him. And then he can walk towards Jesus and he can even become afraid and start to sink in the water before Jesus pulls him out. The second one is a picture of a face and you can decorate it to look like yourself or anyone else that you want. And I left one of the eyes off because I wanted to show you that there's a piece of sticky paper on the back. And when you peel that paper off, you can stick the eye onto it and not need any glue. So it looks like this. And it says, I will keep my eyes on Jesus. It's kind of a weird thing to put a paper in front of my face. I don't think the camera quite knows how to handle that. Let's see how it works with our treasure. There's our treasure chest. Let's see what's in it this week. We have an envelope. We open the envelope. It says, I will keep my eyes on Jesus. What do we have? We have an eye puppet. And I hope when you play with this puppet, it will remind you that we all need to turn our eyes upon Jesus. I hope you have a great week. Bye-bye. Let us pray. How beautiful are the feet of them that bring good tidings, say the scriptures. We are eager, Lord, to hear your good tidings, to listen to the gospel proclaimed and be changed as we hear your stories. Open us to the leading of your Holy Spirit that we might hear, believe, and share your living word. Amen. The story from the Old Testament is from Genesis chapter 37, beginning with the first four verses. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, his son, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to his, their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was the son of his old age, and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him 
and could not speak peaceably to him. And then we are jumping from verse 4 to uh, verses 12 and reading through verses 28. Now Joseph's brothers went to pasture their flock, father's flock near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked him, what are you seeking? I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, they've gone away, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let's not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and he threw him into the pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and rosin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some, Midian, when some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. The New Testament reading is from Matthew chapter 14 verses 22 to 33. This story follows right after the one we read last week when Jesus fed 5,000 men, not counting them women and the children, with just five loaves and two fish. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea, but when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. On a Sunday morning at uh, First Methodist Church in Pensacola, Florida, the young woman who is the Christian Edge Director was discussing dreams with the children during children's time. She said, I used to have bad dreams when I was a child and sometimes I still have bad dreams. For example, the other night I dreamed that I blew up Preacher Henry's house. 
Preacher Henry was the senior pastor. One little girl raised her hand and she wanted to talk, it was clear. And so finally the director called on her and she said, do you wanna say something? One little girl put her hand down and very clearly she said, my mama told me that if you don't have bad thoughts, you won't have bad dreams. How many of you have seen the musical Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat? Um, Joseph's story is a great story of faith, familiar to many people, many children. In the synopsis of the musical, Joseph is introduced as a person like many of us, a person like any of us, a dreamer. It's unfortunate that the lectionary readings leave out Joseph's dreams because it's in the dreams of Joseph that we really get what God was doing. It, it, we see God's working and encouraging and equipping of Joseph through the dreams that Joseph has. It's in, in those dreams that we see God's salvation story of God's chosen people. In verse five and, so, uh, and forward, it says, Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his brother, father and, and his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous, but his father kept the matter in mind. Joseph's brothers thought that Joseph had been having some bad thoughts that were causing him to have some bad dreams and they didn't appreciate it at all. You have to come back next Sunday to get the rest of the story that reveals the true character of Joseph's dreams. Dreams are an interesting thing. According to an article at cbn.com, dreams are one of the most overlooked forms of communication used by God. The scriptures consistently reveal God speaking through this universally experienced and mysterious phenomenon we know of as dreams. The angel's little instruction book says, pay attention to your dreams. God's angels often speak directly to our hearts when we're asleep. Someone has said, dreams are like the paints of a great artist. Your dream are, dreams are your paints and the world is your canvas. Believing is the brush that converts your dreams into the masterpiece of reality. In the 20th century, rational scientific thinking has stolen a lot of the mystery and power from life, but dreams just can't be reasoned away. They're a common experience of all humans, and there's an undeniable, almost irresistible power in them. That's why we make movies and about dreams and we sing songs like, Somewhere over the rainbow, bluebirds fly. Yeah. And the dreams that you dare to dream really do come true. Who hasn't heard about the great American dream? An idea is all about the fact that dreams can and do lead people to realize great things. Dreams really can turn into realities. Next week, we'll read about how Joseph's dreams became reality. Dreams have the ability to encourage us and to empower us to do things that we might never have the courage to do without those dreams. This is especially true for those who, are, who believe that God is in those dreams, that God is the one that gives us those dreams. It's, it's always helpful to know that we're partnered with a power greater than ourselves. By some theologians, God is best known as creative energy. This God energy is in the universe, in the world, in our lives. It's creative energy that's luring us toward God's new future in the same way that the creative energy of an artist lures us into the work of art.
Once there was a young woman who was struggling to find a shape or an image, a name for God that made sense to her. She loved to paint. She felt best about herself when she painted. She, she knew her best potential, felt most in harmony with the universe, touched a place of love and light when she painted. And her struggle ended when she was given the insight to give God the name of what she loved, the name artist. For her, God was an artist, that source of harmony, love, goodness, beauty, that creative source. We're told in the creation stories that God has made humans in the image of God. As I've thought about the idea of God as an artist who communicates and encourages us through dreams, I was inspired to see that our God image quality may be our ability to imagine something that hasn't yet come to be realized. Emily Dickinson wrote, the possible's slow fuse is lit by the imagination. In the gospel reading today, we heard about the 11 disciples who were paralyzed by fear when they saw Jesus walking toward them on the water. But Peter took action. When he saw Jesus walking on the water, he abandoned all fear in his eagerness to try out this new possibility. He said to Jesus, hey, if that's really you, invite me to come out and play with you on the water. And sure enough, Jesus did. He said, come on out, Peter. The water's cool. And so Peter did. He just, he just stepped right out of the boat and started walking toward Jesus. Well, of course, then he noticed that the water was coming up all around him in waves. It was pretty windy and stormy out. And he remembered how water worked and, and he began to sink. But you got to give it to him. He did get out of the boat. Jesus kind of was hard on him. He said, oh, you have little faith. But you got to give Peter some credit for getting out of the boat. He took action because he had a vision of Jesus walking on the water. And that vision gave him courage to do what no other human besides Jesus has ever done. Joan Chittister, one of my favorite theologians, tells a story about the importance of action in realizing a dream. Once upon a time, the Holy One sent his disciples to have a shirt made for a holy event, a holy festival. God be praised, the tailor said, I will do a shirt for this wonderful event by a week from now. Well, the disciples went to pick up the shirt on the appointed day, and the tailor apologized that the shirt wasn't finished. Well, God willing, I will certainly have it for you next week, the tailor said. But the shirt was not ready then either. If Allah blesses us, the tailor said to them, I will surely have it finished next week. When the disciples told the Holy One about the delay, the teacher said, go back to that tailor and ask him how long it will take to make that shirt if he leaves God out of it. Chester makes the point, waiting for God to solve what we're meant to do uh, is ourselves makes life one long unimportant enterprise. We need to do the things sometimes that we leave to God. No wonder we get tired of living. We're all artists, co-creators with God of new possibilities. There are thousands of great dreamers in history. The list is long from Joseph to the signers of the Declaration of Independence and every person who has ever been motivated by a dream that they imagined. One of my favorite dreamers was Dr. Seuss who wrote, my alphabet starts with this letter called yuz. It's the letter I used to spell yuzimatuz. You'll be sort of surprised what there is to be found once you go beyond Z and start poking around. Dr. Seuss had a fun way to articulate God's invitation to imagine and dream. When you let your mind go beyond Z, just think what dreams can do. We're living in a time when our politicians aren't sure what to do about the many dreamers among us who aren't legal citizens in our country because they were brought here when they were very young. But this is the only country they remember. They've grown up here and they've gone to school here and many of them have become professionals here. This is their country for all practical purposes, but they aren't citizens because there's not been a way made for them to become citizens, but they dream of being citizens. 
This is their land for all practical purposes. We live in a time when everyone in the world dreams of a day when it will be safe to gather in large crowds again without fear of mortal illness, when we can worship together again without fear of spreading the disease because we sing boisterously our praise to God, when our children and their teachers can go to school without fear of infecting one another and taking the infection home to their parents and to their loved ones. We live in a land where we dream of one nation truly under God, where the great American dream might actually be a possibility for anyone who comes from anywhere, who works hard, and not just for a few who are privileged by the color of their skin or the pocketbooks of their ancestors or their gender or some other lucky privilege. We live in a world where peace on earth is still the dream of nearly every human being. I leave you with one last dreamer to consider. consider. Surely Jesus was a dreamer. He dared to dream that he could calm a storm, or walk on water, or turn water into wine. He dared to dream that he could heal the sick, or bring the dead back to life. He dared to dream that he could forgive even those who hung him on a cross to die. He dared to dream that he could teach us to forgive each other when we're hurt by those we think shouldn't ever hurt us. He dared to dream all of that. And he died on a cross because he dared to dream that that wouldn't be the end of it all. Jesus, our mentor and savior, has shown us that it's not only somewhere over the rainbow that dreams come true. God has created us in God's image and shown us that we, like Jesus, can walk through the chaos of life if we're willing to keep our eyes on Jesus. We might even be able to walk on water if we follow him closely enough. Amen. Jesus calls us with a tumult of our lives to address the sea. Day by day his sweet voice soundeth, saying, Christian, follow me. Jesus calls us from the worship of the vain world's golden star, from each idol that would keep us saying, Christian, love me more. In our joys and in our sorrows, days of toil and hours of ease, still he calls in cares and pleasures, Christian, love me more than these. Jesus calls us by thy mercies, Savior, may we hear thy call. Give our hearts to thy obedience, serve and love thee best of all. Join me now, please, in the prayer of dedication. Gracious God, we offer to you not only monetary gifts, but our whole selves, our hearts, minds, hopes, and fears. We give them freely and in the knowledge that we can never earn your grace. We thank you that you have empowered us to participate in the miraculous ministry of your Son. Receive our gifts. May your miracle ministry multiply them and use them to soothe the fears and anxieties of our world, both physically and spiritually. Help us to focus on and trust you when the waves wash up around us. Amen. I invite you to pray with me as we pray 
the prayers of the people. Lord God, we navigate strong headwinds at times in our lives. These days feel like strong headwinds. These days when literally tens of thousands of people in our country and hundreds of thousands of people in the world have died from this virus. We seek to see you through our fatigue and fears. We confess that you are truly the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the one who stills the storm and immediately reaches out your hand to keep us from drowning when we turn our eyes from you. We rest for a moment in the joy of your presence, no longer afraid free from anxiety, assured that you do not leave us alone, but seek us out when we're most in need of your peace. Grab the hands of those about to go under the waves of poverty or financial crisis. We ask for you to intervene on behalf of families unable to provide basic necessities for their children, our siblings wrestling with food insecurity those on the cusp of eviction and the unemployed facing the end of benefits. As we see those about to be swamped by the waves of this pandemic, move us to act in ways that lift them out of the roiling sea. Reach out and give courage and strength to people in leadership positions. Grant our leaders wisdom to make decisions in the best interests of the most vulnerable we pray for teachers, administrators, parents, and students as they all seek to navigate a new school year, rife with uncertainty and unprecedented challenges. We lift up the sick and all those who suffer. Give them hope, bring relief, surround them with your mercy. Quiet the dangerous winds of discord and division and stir up the breath of your Holy Spirit to heal and unite us. Help us to build up the body, strengthen our witness and reveal to the world that we follow the one who commands us to love one another. May others look at your church and see your hands and feet at work in the world, feeding and tending, forgiving and repairing doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with God. In this moment, Lord God, we rest in your presence. We worship and praise you as we pray the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Look at the Savior and life.
Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ, and you will be able to walk on water through all the storms of life. May you go from this place blessed in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great week.